I think you've had the introduction. My name is Malcolm McCaig. Uh, the bits we left off the bio at the start is that I play the bagpipes. I like baseball, and by training, I'm an astrophysicist. Now, the, <laughs> the purpose of the talk isn't to tell my story. It's to tell the Kent Reliance story. Uh, and this is uh, probably a very long story, and all I can really do today is tell one chapter of that story. Uh, Kent Reliance uh, started off life as a building society, in fact, the merger of three or four different building societies, the oldest of those being the Kent and Canterbury, which was established back in 1847. So from the point of view of our society, we started off life as a mutual, and we are still today a mutual. However, the structure that we have evolved into is completely different than what we were before. In fact, as far as I'm aware, it is unique in the UK. So if this is the Kent Reliance story, let me start by doing the brief bio on the principal player, which is Kent Reliance. And what you have on the screen in front of you are some key statistics for Kent Reliance. Uh, we are, of course, uh, from origin, a building society. If you rolled the clock back a year ago, then we would be in that league table of building societies featuring just outside the top 10, probably around about number 11 or 12. And that places us as being a mid-sized provider of mortgages and savings in the UK market. And from the stats that you have in front of you, you can see roughly the size of our balance sheet, our staff, our customer member base, etc. Let me tell you a few more interesting facts that aren't on the slide. During the period from 2003 to 2008, we were the fastest growing building society in the UK. You'll see the comment on the slide that we have staff across UK and India. In fact, two thirds of our staff are based in India in our two sites in Pune and Bangalore. This is not an outsourcing arrangement, it's an offshoring arrangement. And our processes and staff between UK and India are very heavily interlinked and work as one. In some of the markets in which we operate, niche markets, uh, we are known as one of the market leaders. So if you take, for example, mortgage lending and shared ownership, we're there as one of the main players. If you take, for example, mortgage lending in the Channel Islands in Jersey and Guernsey, again, we are one of the leading players in that arena. And we featured repeatedly in Best Buy tables for investment products. Uh, the branches, we've turned that into an agency network, so the agencies operate as profit centers in their own right, offering a wider range of services. And that network um, from a year ago has turned the corner. It's now expanding instead of shrinking. But that's part of our distribution network. Uh, we have also have a series of different branding that we use. You can see on the slide, the, the KRBS one is what you see on the shirts, football shirts for Charlton Athletic players. Uh, it, it's rather interesting. We're in a discussion with RBS, Royal Bank of Scotland at the moment. They're claiming that we stole their logo and put a K on the front. You know, why, why would we do that? <laughs> well, the answer was we couldn't fit Kendra Lines Building Society on the football shirt. So um, there's some interesting aspects to the Kent Reliance. The, the key feature of today's talk that isn't on that slide uh, begins with a C, and it's the word capital. Now, Andy's already painted the scene in terms of some of the challenges for mutuals with regard to capital. We start our story with Kent Reliance on this issue of capital constraints and was a very severe issue for us. I talked about the period of growth. When you grow a business, it consumes capital. You don't grow that rapidly by magic. You actually absorb some of the capital. For mutuals, capital is a very sought after commodity. If you create it from retained profits, it's very precious. If you use it on growth, then you're actually using that capital, and it takes a while for that to replenish. And we were in that situation. I think you do that growth, and then you hit the economic conditions which were unfortunate for a lot of us, but it put us in a very awkward position. The low interest rate environment uh, doesn't really help us at all, and we could foresee a period where we were entering into loss-making instead of profit-making. Losses, of course, eat into those profits. And then you've got the increasing regulatory hurdles. It's more than just removing some of the instruments like PIBs. Uh, what the regulatory regime is doing in response to the financial crisis is demanding increased amounts of capital to be held by banks and building societies in the future. So with the advent of Basel III, 
what will increase is the amount of capital you have to hold for mutuals. That is a challenge. Now, we were known as a society which was innovative. In this particular case, uh, our innovation had to be turned not to just member services or competitiveness or being clever. We had to be innovative to survive. And what have we got now? Well, if you look at the, um, the next slide, what you'll see is that we have a picture that starts off with the Kent Reliance Building Society and the members uh, that are the uh, owners of that society, the one member, one vote, typical building society model. Uh, what is now in place and what has changed in that model is that we now have, uh, and take this in steps, the first thing is we've created an industrial and provident society this is another form of mutual, very common in practice. The co-op is an industrial and provident society. So that's a well-known mutual model. Uh, what we've also created underneath that is a banking subsidiary with a banking license so it can execute banking-type services. And that is a subsidiary sitting underneath the, the society. Uh, so we have the, the society, we have the banking subsidiary. Uh, what we now introduce into that model is a source of capital, in this case, a private equity firm known as J.C. Flowers. And for those of you that don't know them, J.C. Flowers are a private equity firm that specialize in financial services, one of the top firms in that category. Uh, and they now enter the frame as a joint shareholder of the banking subsidiary. The way that the shareholding split on transaction at 1st of February was that the society owned 60% of the ordinary shares, roughly, and J.C. Flowers owned approximately 40% of the ordinary shares. So the society remained in control of the banking subsidiary, but has a private equity partner sitting alongside it with a source of capital. And as part of that transaction, uh, when the society put basically the banking services into the subsidiary, J.C. Flowers came along and put in 50 million of capital. So when the dust settles, what we've now got is a well-capitalized bank run on a mutual ethos, and that exact wording is stitched into the articles for how we run that organization. And sitting above that, you have a board which comprises members from both shareholders and some independent directors. Now that model is fine, but I also draw your attention back up to the Provident Society itself. This needs to exist as a genuine mutual bona fide business. And so in that sense, it needed certain things in place to, in order to tick that box. Uh, one of the things we did was we took some of the branch agencies from the bank and loaned them back up to the society so it could get commission income off those branches. So some of the branches actually sit back up at the society level. We also introduced on day one uh, a member reward service. So again, we have arranged a service being provided to members. And the combination of those two things gave us a viable entity as a society from day one. So that, in essence, is the model we have today um, getting to that model has been very difficult. From that bright idea, that's the 1% of inspiration, you then have to realize there's another 99% of perspiration to follow. And I would say as well that uh, we were lucky that in, in J.C. Flowers, they also had the same bright idea when we sat down and talked with them. There was a very quick alignment of the vision and where we might take it, and they've been very instrumental in bringing not just capital, but expertise, drive, enthusiasm, commitment, all the way through the process. Uh, I remember sitting there with Callum McCarthy, Sir Callum McCarthy, and, and we just looked at each other and said, this is a rather strange combination of bedfellows to take a mutual society and a private equity firm and put them together. Uh, but we all felt very committed to what we were trying to achieve, and I think that sustained us through some very trying times. The legislation that we use to create that structure is known as the Butterfield Act. Now, it was created in haste. It's not perfect legislation. It's been used once before in the UK for Co-op Britannia and that merger. Uh, but it had never been used the way that we were using it to create our structure. And as soon as you get into new territory, you are into some very interesting challenges. Uh, you may appreciate that uh, a lot of law is based on case law rather than just the interpretation of the law. And we had very good legal firms like Field Fisher Waterhouse, Allen & Overy, J.C. Flowers had their lawyers, the FSA had their lawyers. 
all the lawyers were looking at this intellectual challenge and trying to figure out how to make it work. Uh, we, we couldn't have got there without them. But the, uh, another aspect is just getting an agreement in place between a mutual and a private equity firm. That wasn't easy either because it's filled with all those complications about shareholder rights, how much control you've got over which issues, uh, service agreements between the society and the bank, uh, exit options, all the things that you have to build into those agreements on day one. So a lot of complication in that area too. And then of course there's the regulatory approvals to get regulatory permissions in place for the new entities, for the banking license, etc. Uh, whatever we might say about the FSA, they were incredibly supportive to us working through that transaction. Now this took not days, not weeks, it took months. From the standing start in September 2009, when we had the bright idea, it took us until July 2010 before we were putting the finishing touches on the structure and the announcements we wanted to take public and explain what we were going to introduce. And that's when one of your worst nightmares came true. All the work that we had been doing was leaked to the press. They got hold of it, and over one weekend, the news, the story broke, and we were not in control of what was being put into the public domain. Now, again, all due respect to media, I know they are there to sell newspapers, but I learned a few things the hard way from the way that they treated us with that information. Uh, they'd managed to dig out from the files and the archives all sorts of stories about our CEO, about Chris Flowers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Th this was a, a field day for them, and they took full advantage of it. And we were quite constrained in how much information we could put out because we had a duty to really inform members first. So we were very limited in being able to fight back and at the mercy of the press in creating a public perception um, that really wasn't very helpful to us at all. And I also learned that you get newspaper reporters that write the article, and then there's another group of people who come along and put the headline on the top. Uh, they're even more vicious than the reporters, the journalists that write the story. So it was a bitter experience for us, and I think it really put us in an awkward place when trying to take forward announcements about the structure and communication to our members. Uh, when we did come to communicate to members, we were not entitled to sell the idea to members. We weren't allowed to convince them it was a good idea. We had to explain what it was about and allow them to come to their own conclusion. We also had to put out a transfer document that catered for any single question that might be asked, because once that was issued, anything we gave by way of a response or a query in writing at an EGM had to coincide with the transfer document, uh, because otherwise we could be giving information to one member that we're not giving to the rest of the members. So the, the transfer document was a very voluminous, uh, legally complex document, not the easy read that you want for your members to explain what it is we're trying to do, but we were constrained and we had to do it that way. Um, and that, that generated, as you might expect, a number of queries. People just jumped to conclusions. Uh, one classic one was, well, you're demutualizing. Where's my windfall? Well, one gentleman wrote in and said, I want my windfall now. And we said, well, we're not demutualizing. He said, well, you've got those damn yanks involved. Tell them to put their hand in their pocket. And we said, no, it doesn't work like that. We need the money for the, for the new structure. And, and if, you, if you're patient in four or five years' time, we might see our way through to dividends, windfalls, et cetera. And the reply came back saying, I'm 87, I can't wait, I want my money now. <laughs> so clearly we were not going to, to satisfy every single member's uh, aspirations. And I think when it finally came to the member vote, which we did at the extraordinary general meeting about a year ago, uh, we had all the usual circus. We had the protesters outside, we had the media hovering like vultures, hoping that it was a, a bad result. Uh, at the end of the day, we got the result from our members backing our structure and allowing us to proceed. And it's interesting, when I mention that to people, one of the responses that comes back is, oh, it was a very close vote, wasn't it? And of course, yes, um, on the mortgage side, it was a clear winner. On the lender side, it was 75.8% and our hurdle rate was 75. We cleared it. If you forget the hurdle rate for a moment, what we're actually saying is three quarters of our depositing members were in favor of the structure. And when we concluded the arrangements on the 31st of January, finally we got the information off to the FSA, all the forms filed at a few minutes to midnight. We woke up on the 1st of February with our new structure. And what happened on day one of the new structure? 
Nothing. It was life as normal. The depositors were still coming and going as normal. Uh, there really wasn't a whole lot of change, not a mad rush of people taking the money out. So it was pretty reassuring to know that we could carry on as, as we expected. But you can move into day two and beyond. What we now see is, is the new structure starting to take effect. We've now got capital injected. We've got a banking subsidiary that has been turned around um, from financial distress to a solid uh, banking capitalized organization with the reassurance that there's a source of capital available to it in the future should it need it. If you look at the, the long, hard road we are taking back to profitability, some of the wins we've had along the way, we have now returned to mortgage lending. We had an 18-month period before the transaction where we couldn't. We just couldn't do that. So we're now back into mortgage lending in the market and serving our members in that way. We are still in Best Buy tables. We've been introducing new products. Um, look at our notice accounts that we've launched. If you look at our um, one-year bonds and the rate on those on the website. They're very competitive. We're increasing our online banking capability. A lot of what we are doing now is what we need to do as a, as a society and as a bank to increase this value of the services to our members. And we want to be their natural choice of financial products. Meanwhile, at the society level, we've also been ambitious in pushing out the society and what it's going to do. And at the board meeting this month, we agreed the new range of services that we'll launch to our members at the society level, which includes wills, funeral plans, insurance, health care. And there's one other as well, which I've forgotten. Um, they'll come back to me. Um, so we, yes, yeah, sorry, foreign exchange, currency. So we actually are growing at the society level as well, and it looks like a pretty good uh, way forward for us in the short term. In the medium term, uh, there's a prospect in four or five years' time that we'll be at the point where we can start to service up dividends from the bank, which JC Flowers can take and we can take and distribute to members if we want to. Uh, and at some point, we'll have to cater for JC Flowers exiting and think of how we replace that source of capital. But in the longer term, our aspiration uh, is to continue our heritage, not from year to year, but from generation to generation. So what does this all mean for our members, and what does it mean for mutuality? Well, I think from our members' perspective, we've done our very best to safeguard their interests uh, for the longer term, to continue to provide services to them that they will value, and going the extra mile in those services, as you would do in a mutual environment, uh, providing some of the security and peace of mind around financial products that they want, so they view us as a friend for life, not just a, a product provider. And contributing as well to the community. Some of our products are directly aligned to community participation, Great Ormond Street, charity bonds, etc. Uh, so I think we're living up to our um, remit in that space. What does it mean for mutuality? Well, we have today um, a new hybrid mutual model that is a proven example, not just a theory, but it's actually there, it's working, you can come, you can touch it, you can see it, you can talk to our members and see what they think of it. So it's there, it works. Um, is it a safe haven for other mutuals, an alternative to simply emerging mutuals? Well, it, it could be. Is it a model that others will copy? I think that's for them to decide. Is it the new lease on life for mutuality? Well, it's too presumptuous of me to say any of those things. All I can say is that we found an answer today to a very difficult challenge. It works for us. It works for our members. And for that, I'm truly grateful. Thank you.